Thanks very much for coming to our panel. Um, and I'm going to introduce the moderator, who will introduce the rest of our extremely distinguished panel, actually. We have some really um, bright lights in this big world of disinformation and disinformation. Our, um, our moderator is Manon Revel, who is a, po uh, is a doctoral student at MIT's IDSS, our partner here. And she has focused her work on using the tools and methodologies of data science to understand the world of information and misinformation and disinformation on the internet. So without further ado, Manon. Morning, uh, Professor Liu talking about computational biology and uh, how data can can inform uh, personalized therapy. We also heard um, Professor Deshin talking about the computational social science and the civil uh, rights, the vote rights. And our panel today is really about the what we could call computational propaganda, which is uh, the fact that we can target an audience with a with a very specific narrative in order to impact the way the information is perceived. Whether you're familiar with the field or not, I think at this point you, you all heard of fake news, misinformation, disinformation in the past years. Um, especially since 2016, we've learned that uh, overseas information operations have attempted to disseminate divisive information uh, in the United States. And this was done through this uh, organized campaigns, whether through organic posts or advertisements that pretended to be coming from American sources. Um, the most famous organization that has been doing these kind of campaigns um, right now is the Internet Research Agency, and uh, that Kami has been studying a lot over the past years. And um, we know that they reached tens of millions of people since 2010, so none of this is really new. They started operations uh, 10 years ago now. Um, and they've been using the social media platforms in order to disseminate this information. These social media platforms have been under great scrutiny recently. Um, for for not metal power through. This is just an attempt to silence you. It happens all the time. <laughs> so what we see is that we have all of these different actors playing on the same battlefield, trying to push for their version of the information. And in order to make sense of this uh, very nebulous situation. Please uh, welcome me and in, in, uh, join me, sorry, in welcoming our our great panel. Uh, so Boyun Park, Camille Francois, and John Donovan, that I'll present briefly. Boyun Park is a PhD candidate in sociology at Harvard University. Uh, Boyun, you've been conducting a fascinating work on um, the different modes of political discourse and the way speeches of political <coughs> candidates have been evolving uh, recently, playing in particular on these cultural boundaries. And you will also be able to tell us more about how the political consultants have been using uh, data and social media to target an audience with a tailored uh, speech. <coughs> Camille Francois is the Chief Innovation Officer of Graphica. You might have heard of Graphica recently because it's the company who got the data from the US Senate Intelligence Committee in 2016. And it's the company who has been, and actually Camille's team, has been uh, studying for seven months the data from uh, Google, Facebook, and Twitter, data that had all of the information about the Internet Research Agency. And so it's thanks to, to you, your report that you, you have with the Oxford Internet Institute, that we know about the reach of the campaigns, disinformation campaigns launched by, uh, by the IRA, who's a, which is a, a Russian-based troll firm. And last but not least, John Donovan is the director of the Technology and Social Change Center at the Shorenstein Center at Harvard, at Harvard Kennedy School. Uh, your team, John, has been said to be one of the world's leading team in combating and understanding uh, disinformation. Well, that's impressive. <laughs> <laughs> I'll let them know. <laughs> and besides working on, uh, on disinformation, the effects and the tools, uh, you've also been working on how different groups engage in order to shape. I have a science thing I can use it again. Um, so you've been working on how the social, different social groups have been engaging online in order to shape the media narratives. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I'd like to bring to everyone's attention a piece that, two actually, two pieces that you wrote that uh, I believe for anyone who wants to make sense of this situation are really uh, important. The first one is the digital influence machine on uh, political advertisements. 
And the second one is um, the deep fakes, cheap fakes, about these new tools that we've been all uh, hearing a lot about. So please, a round of applause for this great panel before we get started. And let's go now with um, the first question to kick off this, uh, this panel. Uh, manipulation of information has actually always been a thing. Whether it's persuasion campaigns or propaganda, we know that uh, even in democracies, this has always been a thing. So could you explain us what really changed in the recent years that made your field emerge, become so important? And also maybe something about what made you uh, interested as, um, as researchers in studying this, this phenomenon. Uh, so, as you're saying and graciously complimenting, and I will not do the thing where I'm like, oh, we're like two kids in a backpack, um, you know, <laughs> as a team. But um, yeah, so one of the things that uh, I did prior to showing up at Harvard and prior to my work at Data and Society was I was interested in understanding communication networks online. So, the past 10 years, I've studied internet communications and looking at what we might call pro-social movements, right? Um, anything from uh, the so-called Elder Spring, the Occupy, it's Black Lives Matter, Standing Rock, all of these different kinds of iterations of the way that people use more uh, communication technologies to get organized. And one of the biggest and most interesting things about studying social movements online is that these are the people who are innovating on the margins of a technology. They figure out how it works once it's deployed. They're not hacking anything, but they are pushing the features in new directions that most designers never anticipated that, you know, for instance, the Facebook events page, you know, oh, maybe people will use it for, for events like birthday parties and, you know, watch parties. They never really imagined that, you know, you would throw, you know, the Occupy movement using Facebook event pages, right, and have 30,000 people uh, signed up to a single event. Um, when, uh, when I was at UCLA, though, I was interested in much more fringe communication networks, so I looked at white supremacist use of DNA ancestry tests. So how were fringe groups understanding scientific communication, bringing scientific communication into their message board communities, and then re-narrativizing their own understandings of race and genetics? And most of the time, I would tell people about that study in 2015, and they would say, oh, cute, like, they're never going to matter. I don't know why you're studying this. Why don't you study things that are bigger? And I was like, there's something about the way that people are able to coordinate and mobilize once they come together for any old thing online, you know, that uh, is concerning and is also potentially a feature of web communications. And, Constantly throughout my research, I've been going back to looking at message boards as this kind of foundational moment where different groups of people that maybe would have never met each other uh, come together in fandom communities and whatnot. There was a, after my postdoc, a, a job opening at Data Society to lead a team specifically on media manipulation. And I thought, oh, I can continue this um, understanding of more fringe communities and how small online cultures have huge impacts on the rest of the world and on the rest of cultures. So we did some different kinds of reports there looking at how white supremacists manipulate the media, looking both historically and at the current formation of what we call the alt-right, and then uh, also looking at the advertising infrastructure in the digital influence machine report to think about. It's not just the case that people were inventing or trying new things. <coughs> social media needed a business plan. I think some of you probably remember the moment of social networking and how social networking became social media. But by and large, there weren't a ton of ads on early Facebook or on um, early Twitter. And they we weren't really able, and even, even YouTube, they weren't really able to monetize in a certain way. And, but, when you look at the ad infrastructures on different platforms and even on Google search, you start to realize that that too has coordinating capacity. And it's trying to use psychosocial incentives to nudge people in different directions. And so we wanted to understand the influence architecture as well as the kinds of communities that might come to use it. Uh, now that we're at Harvard, um, the team is very interested in 
uh, the changes as you are to political communication. So we have a newsletter called Me More Weekly, where we're trying to understand how political communication is interacting with online visual cultures and how the stuff that's made in fringe communities is actually starting to show up in our political campaigns, right? Um, and so that is an interesting turnabout from looking at something like the IRA, who created a lot of media, but it didn't seem to really go anywhere. So there's a lot of the stuff was online, but the distribution capacity of it was limited by their ability to purchase advertising and to mobilize uh, other audiences. And so this is where we're headed in terms of trying to understand at least the 2020 election is that we have a intensely now visual media, visual culture online, and our work is trying to understand more about how political elites, right? Not just the everyday average users are going to use this type of media, but we really want to understand political elites and, and the way in which they're going to use social platforms to either uh, grow voter engagement or perhaps dissuade people from thinking any change is possible. I have to tell a better story now? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't even tell a story. I was just That's like, where have been? Um, <laughs> is that on? Not really, right? Thanks. Thank you, Lil, for sort of bringing us all together. I think um, before we hop into a discussion of the role of data in the fight against disinformation, I'd love to do a very tiny, small detour and talk about the role of women in our field. Um, I come from cybersecurity. I used to study cyber warfare. It is not the most diverse field in history. Um, it is not the case for the field of disinformation. It is not hard to put together a panel on disinformation that is filled with exceptional women who are leading that space. Uh, I feel very privileged that most of my colleagues uh, are women in leadership positions across the field. Doesn't mean it's always easy, doesn't mean they're not real problems. So I just want to touch upon that. I think it's a good moment today for Women's Day to say it is a field in which many women are leading and in which this ability to do rapid, rigorous uh, work together, trusting one another and collaborating across institutions has been absolutely fundamental. Uh, and, um, and footnote. Uh, Thinking about like how I ended up doing what I do, I, I don't really know how I fell down this rabbit hole. I kind of remember sort of like my peaking increasingly into it and then one day I was really deep down. Um, as I said, my background is, is on the study of, of cyber warfare and cyber conflict and so really on how a government developed a large uh, cyber offensive capabilities and specifically my angle was on how everyday people are actually getting pulled on the front lines of these escalating cyber conflict. Um, I was doing some of this work uh, academically over at the Berkman Center and then uh, also spent some time in industry, specifically at Google, trying to do this work and understanding what does it mean for individuals to be on the front line of cyber warfare? What does it mean for human rights activists to get hacked by governments? What does it mean for journalists to be targeted by state actors? What does it mean for women politician to be targeted by authoritarian regimes? And so as I was working through this, um, you know, we were working through the usual motions of we have to defend you against hacking, which is of course very hard because you have well-resourced governments that are you know, very equipped and, and often uh, individuals and organizations who are targeted or not. And, and something sort of like popping up again and again and again a few, few years uh, down, which was people were telling us, yeah, I think we're, 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 we're well charted on the hacking side, but we want to talk about this information and trolling. And we think that some of the thing we're receiving on social media is part of the same dynamic. And I started this project that I cared a lot about with a sort of global coalition of research partners who decided to take this, this subject seriously and to start examining when people report sort of this type of hordes of coordinated harassment, of coordinated disinformation campaign, um, could there be a there there that actually this could be government action targeted against them? And similarly to what Joan experienced, I think a lot of people told me like, yeah, that's really cute. And a lot of the, honestly, a lot of the, the, the targets that I also was working with were saying, the type of harassment that I'm getting on social media, the type of disinformation that's targeting me and my institution, it doesn't feel normal. There's something about it that's really suspicious. 
And more often than not, really, they were told, like, no, it's just because social media is a really nasty, nasty place. And they were like, no, I actually think this is a well-organized government movement. And my aim was to bring the type of rigor and transparency and seriousness that we have in cyber, where we don't tell people when they think that they're being hacked, that they're being cued. We say, oh, that's really important. We're going to investigate. We have methods to detect that. And to bring this to the world of um, state-sponsored information operation. So that took a few years. And then the 2016 campaign and happened, of course, and sort of the, 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 the Russian interference happened. And suddenly it became like a whole different field where everybody was taking it for granted that indeed, Governments do have troll farms, and they do do that. And you know, this is actually something that happens in the real world. And um, at this stage, I was already sort of like halfway down the rabbit hole. So this made for the last uh, sort of mile of it. And since then, I've been um, detecting, investigating, uh, analyzing the types of uh, large-scale um, disinformation campaigns that foreign actors, Russia and others, uh, are are leveraging online, but also that we can sort of increasingly see. Uh, for higher actors, sort of like disinformation shops um, pursue around the world. I'm going to bring the more nerdy point of view here from an um, academic background. Um, so my research lies at the intersection of cultural and political sociology. And the way I got interested in the topic of political discourse and um, the cultural practices of political consultants um, was because I felt that while we talk a lot about data, the use of data, politics and how we all ended up here. Um, we really, using the analogy of the market, study the demands of the people, but not so much the supply side of institutional politics. So a lot of scholars have talked about how pe why people are angry, frustrated, why they voted for some type of candidates, but we really didn't have access to what happens on the other side of how speeches get made of how candidates actually can um, do foreign diplomacy via Twitter. Um, so I got interested in, in the role that political consultants play and their approach to using the new tools that we have. Um, here in this room, we all know that data analytics and, and social media play an important role. But how did political consultants and advisors actually adopt the idea that we had to use it and use it in a way that will actually serve a, a beneficial purpose? Uh, you might recall that the Hillary campaign has been really heavily criticized for having led a too data-driven campaign and for having missed the big picture. So how do we kind of react to that? And um, I got interested in, in this um, kind of transitional process of political consultants. So I wasn't actually told that the project was too cute. I was, I was told that it was too ambitious uh, <laughs> because there would be an access problem, but I was lucky enough um, to get in touch with um, the prominent political consultants, pollsters, and advisors that have worked uh, with the recent um, presidential campaign um, in all levels, um, including campaign managers and people at the White House. So um, I really look forward to talking about that. But to answer and kind of segue to the next batch of questions, what has changed? It's basically not only that, as we all know, have had social media and data analytics everywhere now, it's actually there has been a very cognizant approach to saying that we need to use data analytics in campaigns. So I was able to go to the recent political consultants conferences um, all around the country, and all they say is, how are we going to make, make use of this more efficiently? And, and learn from the more private sector, the consumer data, to actually adopt it to politics. They all say, like, we're, we're left behind. We need to catch up, and we need to actually make efficient use of this data. So not only do we have more data, analytics, and social media around us, and more information and disinformation, but there has been an active um, kind of consensus race to make use of it in our election and politics. Okay. Thank you very much for, for your answers. So what we, what we see, which is really related to the title of this panel, is that some part of the data is weaponized. There are target people, and some of it is scrutinized in order to better understand how, how people uh, react. And um, something that seems very odd to me is the fact that the different set of actors we have seem to be using exactly the same methods. Whether you talk about um, some of this disinformation campaign, go on, on the advertisement tools on Facebook and, and run advertisement campaigns. Uh, political uh, candidates also use the same advertisement campaigns on Facebook. So how do we make a difference between the good actors, the bad actors, the legal actors, the illegal actors? 
when when the set of method is the same, um, but when the actor is, is actually different. I'm happy to take a first crack at it. So um, we think about it using um, what I call the ABC framework, which recognizes that there are different dimensions of disinformation. ABC here stands for actor, behavior, and content. And the idea is you can have a disinformation campaign because there's a bad actor behind it, but the behavior of the campaign is normal and the, and the content of the campaign is normal. Or you can have a disinformation campaign because of the behavioral amplification techniques that are used, right? So bots and um, all the types of uh, things that you can do to do coordinated and authentic amplification. Or you can have a disinformation campaign because of the content, right? So for instance, manipulated media um, or uh, information that's designed to tell people that uh, the vote is happening two days earlier or something like that. And so by understanding that there are different factors at play, that sometimes they all happen together and sometimes it's just only one of them, you take a first step and say, okay, what's different between spam, fake news, and you know, Russian interference, right? And you start like sort of opening this big box of what we call disinformation to extract different types of problems. The fact that your uncle has spread something that's stupid on coronavirus on Facebook is fundamentally a very different problem than a spam network that's using automation and bots to do uh, hentai Hong Kong protesters uh, messaging on social media, which is again super fundamentally different than uh, the Russian military intelligence using fake profiles to incite uh, protest in the streets, right? So my first guidance here is like, let's break down the different dimensions of the problem and sort of like the subcategories of, of what's at play. It is the case though, that often we see techniques that are kind of used by everyone, right? So fake profiles. I'm going to create a fake person on social media. We see a lot of people doing that, right? Like well-meaning political consultants, and I'm like, please don't do that. <laughs> State actors, PR shops. So you kind of, you know, there are tendencies that run across this, but fundamentally, like, they are different problems. And to add to that, um, because that framework is getting a lot of traction within Facebook and other uh, Google, and the one challenge I have is the D for design, which is to say that you don't get the scale of disinformation without bad design which is to say that uh, one of the people from Facebook affectionately said, ABC, fish, 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 D, water. And I said, yes, but water is fundamentally different from the organisms that, that swim around in it. And the issue is now one of scale because, it, and this is the historian in me, doesn't want us to forget that there was a time where many of us had no idea how to use these technologies, right? And, We've had 10 years of practice of doing social media, and as a result, the design has shifted in different ways, and people who we might call bad actors might be using the same behaviors as marketers, and you know now political consultants are saying, well, how do we do the same disinformation thing, but for good? Right? Like, how do we get our message out there using fake accounts and pretending to be um, news organizations, for instance, that fundamentally is a problem of design because the design of social media is one of amplification, right? It is, it is the boombox of our generation. When the boombox became a social problem, it was because people were using it in public, mostly black youth, and there was this big push, if you look at the history, towards the, the Walkman and like, you know, cassette players, those, those are truly good technologies because they're private and they, you know, nobody gets bothered by them and the boom box is this terrible thing that ruins trips to the beach and it ruins going to the park. And so there's all these op-eds out there about this technology and if you look at the history of that and then map it onto what we're doing now, I'm trying to understand the effect of social media, it's not always the content that matters, but the scale, the volume, the scope, and how it intrudes upon our everyday lives, which is to say how it shows up in a news feed or how it shows up. Remember when Facebook used to call it the wall, right? And you'd be like, post on my wall, right? My wall, right? My news feed. And as a result, 
you know, as we move into social media, we have to understand the shift both in the kinds of practices, the amplification design of the technology, and then who are these intruders? Like, who are these people creeping into our spaces, uh, perhaps cloaked as something that they're not? And so, as we adopt frameworks as a field to understand this, never forget that the thing in itself None of those behaviors are possible without bad design. Bad actors can't scale without bad design. And of course, the content uh, doesn't, doesn't go anywhere without bad design. Or you could call it infrastructure, uh, if you like. But um, those are the kinds of things that I think about as we talk about the way in which data is going to shift and uh, how the design is going to play into this, this new media ecosystem. And I would only add one thing. When you ask that question, and the first word that kind of popped into my mind is a sociological concept that we call boundary work. So understanding what is legitimate, what is not legitimate, what is good, what is not good. In order to actually analyze and actually make sense of this, you have to understand what it is in the first place, right? The problem that we face today is that most, um, well, not, I wouldn't say most of us in this room here, but um, most people don't quite understand what we're dealing with. Right? So it's a very difficult to understand what will be legitimate, what will not be legitimate, um, even web scraping, right? We, when it first started, we used to be able to scrape everything. Now we have to be more careful about that, right? So it, it goes at a pace that's so fast that we don't even have time to grasp what we have and what we can do with it. So in order to understand what's okay and what's not okay, we need to actually have more of a con societal consensus of what will be good practice and not good practice. And um, so Joe asked us before the panel, are we all pro-regulation here? Um, <laughs> we can kind of, um, but regulation or not, at least we need to have a societal understanding of what it is and the impact that it can have. And that needs a, a consensus and an understanding of what it is. And yes, technology is fast. Yes, we're going to have new tools available to us. But having a set of common understanding of the boundary work that we need to do with it is extremely important. I, just building on that, you know, given your work, something that that's been particularly frustrating for me, mm -hmm. have, have you know, working on twenty twenty is we do see a race for candidates in campaign. We're like, what can we do? And my first, you know, instant is always to say, well, why don't you set your own boundaries, right? Mm -hmm. Why don't you, as a candidate, as a campaign, as a party, start by saying, here are the social media practices that we will not do, and we will ask our supporters to not do that. I will not use fake profiles. I will not try to infiltrate other people's groups. I will not harass on social media. Whatever, right? Pick, pick your, pick your, pick your favorite. The lack of political leadership on this question has been astonishing. I think the only candidate who went on the record with a clear description of what she did not want her supporters to do and what she would not tolerate her campaign to do was Elizabeth Warren. We didn't hear a peep from anybody else, and I think like if we want to start regulating social media disinformation in an age of political discourse, we're going to need a little bit of leadership from political leaders in saying those are the things that we are not going to do and we are not going to tolerate <coughs> supporters do on our behalf. It could also be regulation, it could come from any number of places, but I think like we're so far from having gotten this ball rolling that uh, it's going to make my work as a, you know, and Joan's work as a disinformation detector and researcher is even more um, tedious in the mm. months to come. Well, like, one thing that I've been really flummoxed by, and I know I shouldn't touch my face in front of a group, <laughs> but I am like that kind of frustrated about it, is the moment that um, news became politicized through fake news, 2014, we knew what we were talking about as data folks, uh, I, myself sometimes included, was to say a fake news site is an imposter site. It's using some spoofing, maybe it looks just like a news site, and it's abc.go instead of abc.com, and you'd say, that's fake news. Then as the term got politicized with Trump calling WAPO and everything else fake news, we actually lost all the levers of power we had within social media companies to get them to, to act on a single thing. Exact same thing right now is playing out with disinformation, where political elites are pointing at things and saying, that's disinformation. And it's sort of like, no, that's a political ad. So when Bloomberg doesn't pay Twitter, but circulates an ad with a bunch of, the, talking about the one with the crickets in the background, 
where it looks like he's shut down everyone and he's like, you know, I, he's he's the best at the debate and nobody else is going to be good at the debate, right? But there's crickets in the background of this ad. But because he doesn't pay for it, it's not coded as a political ad, right? Un and then, you know, candidates put point at it and say this is disinformation, this is this should be this should be taken down, right? The moment that shift is now upon us, disinformation holds no water. And privacy scholars feel the same way about years and years of working on privacy turned into a hyper-individualized concept and then it didn't work anymore as a framework. And so we're heading into this moment now where even the boundary work around disinformation, the lack of leadership, um, is going to tilt this in that same way where disinformation is going to have to be thrown out and we're going to have to do something else to get people to see the problem in the same way. Thank that you. sounds scary. I mean, but you know it's happening. Yeah. Yeah. It's just as well. I live in denial, though. I know. <laughs> I mean, the optimism is real. You have to keep it with you at all times, like in your pocket. But um, yeah, it's just, it's never a good uh, situation to be in where political elites are taking the field in a different direction without taking ownership for the way they they play in this space as well. Yeah. I think that's interesting because it's really true what you're saying, unfortunately, and I think the way we've been reacting to this as an expert community is kind of like hunkering down in our increasingly more nerdy sub-definitions and sub-categories, right? So it's like, I no longer know what you're talking about when you say fake news and disinformation. Here are my 12 subcategories and all the food notes that come with it. Which one are you talking about? <laughs> no. yeah. And I think it's true that there's sort of a, an effectiveness problem that comes with that. And to go on in this, the, so what you've been describing are, are the dynamics, the number, the speed, uh, the categories of this different kind of misinformation. And the, the next piece to this, um, to this thought process is about how does it actually impact the behavior of people, which is this hard uh, step to make between one and the other. And, um, and so I'd like to ask you if we take a very specific case of elections, because it's the one of the spotlights, because of 2016, 2020 coming soon. Um, do we have a metric to say how much uh, does disinformation or misinformation impact elections? And so then, if you can first answer this question on the very specific question, do we actually have a metric to say persuasion campaign by a candidate or by internet research agency has been able to have this specific quantified impact? And as a second time, as if you can uh, inject this in the debate, uh, do we know if uh, we have significant effects on our life, on society beyond elections? Uh, so, does this information has other effects beyond uh, election times? Like, I can start with that one. Political consultants are using more quantifiable metrics. Uh, they have higher demand for it because you can track the progress for it. They have two metrics they're struggling with. First of all, persuasion. Nobody can tell me they uh, we have like a perfect metric of persuasion, so they're not able to actually really like, get people in people's mind and track whether they change their minds or not. It's the second thing is about information and disinformation more specifically. Regardless of whether you have a metric or not, the political discourse today has evolved in such a way that it's your metric and it's my metric and I'm telling the truth. You know, remember like the, the whole craziness about fact checking in 2016, right? So we're all about that. But the references have shifted so much that your fact is not my fact. And we can't really have the same conversation or the same definitions, and then it's just more subcategories, right? So um, the line there becomes really blurry, and it becomes much more challenging to track what is the fact that we're looking at and whose fact it is, right? So I think a bit sadly, as of now, is that regardless of whether if one specific campaign and the other has a metric or not, they're not using the same one, and they're not trusting each other's. Yeah, foreign interference is a bit of a different question here. Um, the, the very simple sort of answer to your question is no. We don't know how to measure the impact of foreign interference for many different complicated reasons. Um, we do know that some of the institutions like the IRA, that specific 12 form that you named, they, they are structured like a digital marketing shop, and so they have analytics people who track the performance of the posts that they create, right? And when you have trolls sending divisive messages on social media, someone is in charge of reporting monthly and say, this, this is a high-performing post, this is the reach of that campaign, this is the click-through rate on this image. But that's one thing. 
The thing that's complicated is if you do want to um, evaluate the effectiveness of a foreign interference campaign, you have two different overarching issues. The first one is as the targeted country, you want to know if it had an impact on the vote. Well, the problem is political scientists don't know how to answer this question, and therefore it's absolutely unreasonable that we will be able to answer that question in the context of foreign interference. That's sort of like a known set of variables that are not measurable. The second thing is the aim of a foreign interference campaign is not necessarily to impact the vote. It's to divide, it's to confuse, and it's to create chaos. How do you measure chaos? There's an other and different complicated story. You have to take into account how many people did you manage to have yelling at one another, both on the internet and off the internet, and how much everybody freaking out as a result of your campaign have you succeeded into doing, which means every time we run around saying, oh, our democracy has been completely overturned by Russian trolls, we're kind of contributing to this success metric too. So for a lot of like complicated interlocked reasons, no, we don't have a good set of um, clear metrics to measure the effectiveness of foreign interference campaigns. Yeah, and as a sociologist, I, I mean, the kind of what you learn in 101 is it's always correlation, it's never causation, right? And you can correlate a bunch of things and try to say, well, let's look at trends over time and say, what, what are the many variables that could have contributed to a shift in behavior? Now, many of us, there are certain behaviors we will never shift, like having to have a cup of coffee in the morning. Right? The only variables that are going to stop you from having a cup of coffee in the morning are like broken legs <laughs> and no coffee. Right? <laughs> like that's it, right? And so it's like when you talk about voting behavior um, and you look at the weather and you're saying, well, in counties where there was rain that day, we had lower voter turnout over time. Right? So there's all these different kinds of reasons. And then to get down to the gradation of a single persuasive message is the reason why someone decided not to vote or decided to vote for a candidate. Just, it just doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense in, in the way that we think about uh, our world. But that's not to say that media narratives don't matter, right? And this is different, which is to say that when media takes up a, set, a turn of phrase or a framework, and starts to tell everybody that it's happening, it's sort of happening no matter if it's not happening, right? Because media frames a lot about what we understand about the world around us because I'm not gonna be able to tell you what's happening in, I'll pick France today, but if I wanna find out, then I have a different set of gates that I need to go through. Either uh, I go online and I search for France and it sends me a bunch of stuff about France and coronavirus because that's what's popular online or I, I target my search a little bit deeper and say that I'm interested in um, you know, something, something else uh, in France, right? And so the ways in which the gates have changed around media and, cre and the creation of media narratives is important for understanding how people do anything, right? How people show up in the world, if they vote, if they don't vote. With social media, you have many, many more narratives um, and it was at the Night Media Forum last week where Trump's uh, chief digital officer was saying, we have more opportunities to be informed than ever, all right? The, the internet is great. It's, and then, you know, the Judy Woodruff who was interviewing him said, well, then why are we, like, stuck in the mire of misinformation if we have more opportunities than ever? And that's because we're, we're starting to miss, again, the infrastructure of the communication and that some people's opinions some media narratives matter more. And then with social media, they're gonna matter more to different niche communities. And the structure of that is something that we have to look at if we're gonna understand how disinformation moves into different uh, niche communities and then has a broader impact on society. And you know, the big fight right now is uh, last, you know, a couple of years ago it was bot, not a bot. Is, is this person I'm talking to even real? Now it's, you know, there's that plus the, is this person being disingenuous, you know, conversations around, uh, you know, the Warren lads and the Bernie bros and, you know, uh, all of these things are in a way um, fantastical in a sense because we don't actually know what we don't know about what's happening in online discourse. 
and we're attaching meaning to them and saying, well, so and so, you know, has too many people online that are toxic and critical, and therefore maybe I might go vote for another crowd, right? I don't think that's actually Im impacting the vote. I think voting is a very personal. Um, uh, it's almost like communion in a way. It's like you choose it. Um, and, but I do think that um, if we are going to get at this question of impact, we have to face facts, which is that um, people might do things for a hundred different reasons and we need to be accountable to all of those. Um, but we can't take away from the fact that there are things in this world that are structuring how we see the world. And so we always want to ask bigger questions than did this discrete piece of disinformation have any impact? Because I'll tell you, you know, the, the Pope didn't endorse Donald Trump, but that was an important media narrative. Um, Pope doesn't have coronavirus. That's the big one today. Um, you know, and so it's like, you know, but how do, how do we digest all of that? And then what effects does it have on what we think about it as truth? You know, is, is it the case that social media is going to destabilize truth as we know it and then what kind of society do we live in if no one believes anyone uh, about anything ostensibly that is uh, really important like uh, not being a face toucher and washing your hands and you know participating in your in your democracy thank you very much i'd like to open the floor to questions from the audience if uh, um, I've heard a lot about uh, the degradation of journalism, and uh, I was kind of curious about um, if you have any sort of metric for subtlety, or like, because some things are blatantly fake and some things are, you don't know what the journalism stuff. Yeah, the subtlety thing I just call conspiracy, right? And this is sort of the way in which conspiracy theories have come to live and take hold online is that. You, you are not going to be able to tell me yes or no, most of us in this room, if, if vitamin K has any health attributes. But if you Google vitamin K or you look into it uh, and you find it on different forums, it's um, something that people are pushing as uh, a potential you know, cure for autism, right? Um, uh, as, as well, right now with the coronavirus stuff, it's, um, there's a, a conspiracy around Purell and why we're having a Purell drought. And then people are saying, well, if you wash your hands with vodka, it's the same. <laughs> and I was like, OK, but like, that's way more expensive. <laughs> um, but it's all to say that there's, so there's the fake news thing that you can see in the metrics. You can see it in the way in which website, like look, if you look at certain websites and you use the built with, you can actually see that they're using a ton of freeware and you know they're they're just trying to make make things work together and a lot of it is just absolute grift right it's they, it's just about getting uh, clicks returns for for advertising the conspiracy stuff is much more uh, insidious in the sense that it cooks over time and like it becomes a thing so there's a couple of things we're watching right now very closely that came out of Super Tuesday um, is this notion that Joe Biden has dementia, right? So there's a, there's people who are just tweeting it because it, it makes sense to them. But over time, we're starting to see a narrative form. And this is the same narrative formation that we saw around Hillary's health and that Hillary was very sick. And we're seeing people start to plant the idea that Joe has dementia in the replies of journalists. And then journalists start to, to start to ask questions like, have we seen Joe Biden's health records recently? And, um, and so the, that, that, that part of it, I don't know if we're ever going to have a metric for, right? Because it's so much of a, it's so much about subtlety and nudging, trying to get journalists peaked on an issue and then seeing where they might take it. Um, and we see this time and time and time again, week after week. Just to add on that, I'm like in a second. Subtlety in the era of some scrolling environments, I think is a qu big question that the political science and the political consultants are asking themselves. So you have to actually show the subtle differences in a not subtle way. 
because in a thumb curling environment, people are not going to pay attention to the subtle differences. You know, like the Warren and Sanders, how their uh, healthcare program changes. They have to like say it in a not subtle way, even though there might be more subtle differences. Mm. So I think subtlety in the era of thumb curling environment is a question that we have to ask ourselves today. Okay. Hi, thank you for the great conversation. Um, Joan, you mentioned bad design. Um, so I was wondering that in a, in a technical landscape that changes so fast, what are some ways that are guiding principles that can um, be used to design these communication networks so that they can be resilient against um, you know, disinformation, misinformation, and things like that. Yeah, I think one of the principles is actually core to your field, which is like, you know, the, the question of scale should actually be, what is the smallest audience that I can design for, and how do I keep that community in place, rather than thinking, how am I going to scale this to the level of the world, right? The same algorithm that makes uh, YouTube popular for unboxing videos and Yankee Candle reviews is the same one that creates the hornet's nest of the far right. And what we know is when people are using content or placing content on a place like YouTube and the content might um, go against their terms of service, that the company is largely relying on flags. But if you like that content, you're not going to flag it, right? So that, that is fundamentally broken at the outset if you assume that everyone using your technology is going to use it for good. The other thing, and this is a more of a linguistic critique of algorithms, is that a lot of algorithms related to search are not able to understand something as fun as sarcasm and, uh, or something as nefarious as the way in which uh, white supremacists will, will change their language to evade any kind of text ban on a word. And so uh, one of the things that we were studying with YouTube is just looking at the chats and how uh, YouTube had decided they were going to ban a whole list of words. And so there were a bunch of white supremacists in a chat room trying to figure out which ones were banned. And so they were, you know, saying, okay, I, I wrote that word, I wrote the word, and then instead of saying Jews, they'd say juice, right? It sound alike, right? And we know this, like Leet Speak, the history of hacking, hacks of words, we love that stuff, right? It's, it, so when, companies intervene on the algorithm as well, they don't always pay attention to what those adaptations are going to be. And I um, suggest thinking through a process of continuous design and maintenance, understanding that the internets and platforms are not products at all. They are processes and they require participation. And so you know, every day, I, I don't know how many people are working at Facebook a day, but let's say 100,000 people wake up and go to work there, right? It's not the case that the website or, you know, the platform works without people. And so dedicating resources to those people who are going to be looking at the aspects of the design that are, are u being used in a harmful way is really critical. But then also getting on board with that, you have to, there's a level of, Mid, middle level of management in these companies around policy that um, don't always empower uh, people who are building the products to think through continuous design because they want to ship and you know and they want it to be the same they want it to work the same way every time and they want it to work for everyone in the same way but I think now that we have so many people online that we can't actually think about is there you know, one end stage for any of these platforms and do they serve all communities uh, usefully uh, in the same way? Like we know those answers are, are no at this point. And so that's, that's where the advocacy work within companies starts, I think. Uh, you know, and I'm, uh, I read everything that comes out of uh, the Tech Won't Build It coalition of people because I think that that's the forefront of how we're gonna get where we're going is going to be the people building it, um, not the people regulating it, or even the people that are in charge ostensibly, um, who don't necessarily have to work on the technical side. Yeah, ideas? I mean, I can give a sort of very rapid answer to that question as someone who 
also been working on the design from the inside of the companies, you basically have sort of like two dimensions, right? The first one is how are you, can you be thoughtful when you design your product initially? And I think here what we're learning is if you design a product that's meant to say if, uh, you know, your college roommates are hot or not on campus, this will likely not scale very well for global, <laughs> subtle political conversations. <laughs> And I think you're like, there's an emerging body of research that's really thoughtful and great on how do you design for more thoughtful approaches? How do you design for communities you care about? There's a book that just came out from the MIT Press called Design Justice. It's wonderful on that. And so this is like, how do you be thoughtful from scratch? And sort of opposite movement from thoughtful is like, how do you keep on being adversarial, right? Like, similar to what we do with spam detection work. How do you look at your product and continuously poke at it trying to figure out, okay, if I'm the, the bad guys, like how do I uh, how do I break this product? How do I leverage it against people that I uh, that I want to attack? And sort of having this sort of dual movement of being extraordinarily thoughtful when you create and being extraordinarily adversarial with your own product to understand how it will be abused, how it will be misused is kind of like what we need to do. Short version. I have one question. Uh, did you both sort of just quickly mention, all three of you talked a little bit about regulation. What are your views on regulation? <laughs> I brought up the word I can start. <laughs> um, I think it's critical that we have a fair assessment of the impact that all of this will have in our society. Um, that's a very vague way to say that we need regulation. <laughs> um, and I think the question is, at some point, we'll have uh, a common understanding that we should have had regulations way before that we actually knew the consequences of all of this. Um, I wanted to bring up Twitter um, started banning political ads um, way after we've had political ads on Twitter for a very long time. Google is restricting micro-targeting as well. And actually, the industry, the political consultant industry, and us in general, are reacting to that post facto, right? And we are letting those private companies actually dictate the ways that we, what's going to get regulated or not. Uh, when I ask the political consultant whether it has going to have an impact, most of them say no, because they have their own way of doing micro-targeting anyway, regardless of whether it goes through the Google platform or not. Um, so, yes, we don't have a common understanding of what's going on, and yes, we need to that. And yeah, um, I think that when it comes to the advertising part of it, that the micro-targeting is something that we, we don't understand, and we also know how powerful statistics mm -hmm. are, right? Statistics meaning essentially like the way in which we govern states and we take sort of the public opinion pollings and the way in which platforms were designed um, around harnessing and collecting and selling off data, um, you know, we don't have any kind of meaningful consent around that. And so I, would, I think that we do need regulation around micro-targeting, but then we also need some kind of broader regulation around the app environments that has meaningful consent uh, put into it, which is to say that if an app is really leaky, and it is giving data to other places and is basically there to mine our, our connections and our, our contacts, then there needs to be some kind of regulatory body around your app can really only collect as much data as it needs to run, right? Because if, if your business model isn't really games, uh, but it is selling, at, <laughs> selling the data of the people who's, who, who use your app, then uh, we, need, we need more help there. Around the hate speech piece of this um, and network harassment, we have laws that should be uh, much more utilized around when someone is getting attacked. And, uh, but it's increasingly harder and harder to find uh, the individuals who are to blame for uh, network harassment or even swatting. It's been difficult to find people who, are, who have swatted others and you know people have died as a result of that um, and then around the hate speech piece I think that there is a lot of stuff that platforms can do to enforce um, restrictions and, and uh, to not allow that kind of behavior on their platforms and we'll see uh, you know the, the grand tension with all laws is that they only matter if they're enforced and all regulation all policy only matters if it's enforced but the 
cost of doing nothing is too high right now. I, I'm a classic French person. I'm all in for regulation. <laughs> I agree with Joan too. Like a lot of these are frameworks we exist in definitions we have, right? So I'm very, for instance, I'm really interested in the role of consumer protection. At some point, we're saying like consumers are being lied to on the internet. You know, people are paying for bots. Like, but, you know, we do have institutions and regula regulatory framework that address consumer protection. And I think the question is, how do we bear those, uh, and how do we how do we apply those? How do we equip the institutions we have in order to be able to uh, apply those? Um, but yes, I'm I'm all in favor of regulation. I think. Uh, we're past the moment where we uh, wanted to do a trial period to see how self-regulation was going to end. That ended poorly. Okay, we can take, I think, a couple of last questions. Okay. Um, building off of all of that, I was curious um, for each of you, like, what is your dream vision for how you think um, the split for regulation should fall on government or different government agencies versus like the companies themselves? So just to be clear, I don't define whatever company does as regulation, right? Maybe it's governance. They, they do a lot of stuff and it's great and we should like criticize that. But for me, regulation is institutional, right? So it's government and government agencies and, and governmental bodies, right? And I think that we've been sort of like living in this idea that when a company writes the terms of service, decides whether or not it wants to implement it, and decides whether or not it wants to tell you if they implemented it or not, we say, oh yeah, that's regulation. No, that's not. That's just a private actor decided whatever they want to do in their area, right? Like regulation to me, and then I'll, I'll let you both address it, but when I say regulation, I mean institutions, rules, consequences, you know, duty to, du duty to report transparency about what you've done. Yeah, I, I, I agree entirely. And I'm thinking here, you know, as someone in Massachusetts who, when they passed gay marriage in Massachusetts, it was great, but then you couldn't live anywhere else with your spouse, right? And it was just sort of like, oh, okay, this is how regulation feels when you're left out in other places. And I'm thinking here around some of the regulation about AI-generated content or what we're calling deep fakes publicly. This is going to be consequential, I think, because I think there's a lot of momentum around trying to get imposter content, scam content, hoax content offline. And then at the same time, you have technological innovation that's always going to be six or seven years ahead of the regulation. So th the deficit and the, the problem is, is that we lack um, innovative regulation, right? We, we lack regulation that that would uh, maybe even quarantine an industry to a small set of actors that then could sort of prove or disprove if this thing is gonna be harmful or not to society. And we used to have ways in which universities were used to help us understand the efficacy of different drugs. Big Pharma bought them out, um, you know. And so there's a lot to unpack with where corporations come into the regulatory moment, but part of this issue is disclosure, which is to say, we rarely know what corporations are doing until it shows up different in our, you know, apps or like, you know, we, especially around APIs, like if you're going to give us access, give us access because we're built, we're spending a lot of money to build tools to sort the data. And then if you shut down part of the pipeline, you know, we've just lost, you know, maybe $300,000 worth of something that we've been trying to build. So there's different pieces of this also that need to be regulated that aren't necessarily, um, you know, it's not like Walt Disney got a bunch of regulation just about Walt Disney. Like, I don't think we need Facebook regulation, Twitter regulation. I think we need something broader that's going to understand data and access and auditing uh, so that when, you know, Facebook changes its name, for instance, to evade some kind of regulation, uh, we don't want to be stuck uh, in, you know, trying to catch up. Just one thing to add, that regulation will have to be global. And that's the core of the challenge for it. Mm -hmm. Technology is not bound by national boundaries. Yet institutions, most of them are. So how are we going to deal with that in this new nature and this new type of regulation we're going to have? International cooperation is going to be critical. Thank you very much. I, I, Sally, I think we have to wrap up. Thanks a lot again for uh, to our great panelists and for your